Okay, so if you before before saying anything else, um, thanks guys. Um, if you don't remember, and sometimes I forget too, right? How would we how do we remember ourselves? How how this goes? Well, I might think. Well, I know one factor for sure because I know one of the key roots of negative twenty seven is negative three. So one of the factors of this polynomial is the binomial x x plus 3, right? So I know x plus 3 is a factor, for sure. How do you know that negative 3 is Because So I just happen to know one of the cube roots is negative, negative 3. So one of the roots is negative 3 in this polynomial. Okay. So that's got to be true. And then, um, I don't know, what goes here? Uh, well, we know we need an x squared to produce an x cubed. And we know we need an, a plus 9 to produce the 27. And then the only question remaining would be what goes there? Um, well, let's th you know, we need stuff to cancel out, right? So here we have 3x squared. So how about if this is, this will be a negative 3x, so that this will be a negative 3x squared. That, th th then those will cancel out. We'll get 3x squared and negative 3x squared. That'll disappear. The other one that needs to cancel out is the 9x. But that'll cancel out with the negative 9x. So I think we're okay. It's kind of trial and error. The other way you could do it, if you know x plus 3 is a factor, is you could also uh, actually do the, the work, right? And up top, if you do the division, it should come out perfectly with remainder zero. And you should up on the top here get this. Right? It'll work great. That would work great. Wouldn't it? So you can do that too if you weren't sure. All right. Cool. So therefore, of course, x is equal to negative 3 is a root. Yay. And what are the other roots? x equals b, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Yeah. So that'll be 3 plus or minus the square root of negative 27 all over 2. So that's 3 halves plus or minus 3 root 3 over 2 times i. All right, so those are our three roots of negative 27. Does that make sense? How you could do this using old school technology. Right? So three answers. If you were to cube any one of them, you would get negative 27. You could try that, right? That's the point. Cool? All right. So now the question would be, how would you find fifth roots or, or something like that, or fourth roots? You could do, there is actually a factory pattern which maybe you learned for, for, it's similar. Let's say we're doing fifth roots. You'd have this, and then you have some, you have some over here, you have some fourth degree polynomial instead, right? Wouldn't it be? And it works great. It factors great, but you have to maybe remember that. And then also, what would you do with that fourth degree? We don't have like a, a way, maybe a nice way of solving for the fourth, for the four fourth roots of that equation. So maybe we're up a creek at that point, right? So maybe we need some more heavy machinery brought in to help us out, right? So we'll we'll take another approach today, which is a little bit more general for finding roots. But I just wanted to remind you that you do know how to find for cube roots. You do know how to find those cube roots if it's a real number we start with and all that. Um, we'd also like to be able to find the cube roots of like other things, more exotic things. Can you find the three cube roots of 1 plus i? Right? This technique might be a little bit trickier with a complex number instead of negative 27, right? So there are a couple reasons we need to kind of bring in some extra machinery today. So that's what we're going to do here. Um, and we're going to find some complex. Okay, so um, we're going to take a little note, but actually today is going to be mostly driven by an activity thing that I have for you, um, and that's what most of the time you'll be doing today, is this activity. So before we, we should kind of set the stage though, right? Let's say from our previous lesson, I've just copied and pasted this directly here. So this is exactly what you should have in your notes already. This is DeMaal's theorem. There it is, again, just as a reminder, because we're going to use that today. Together with another result that you should already know, the fundamental theorem of algebra, which says that for every polynomial, it has a unique factorization, or equivalently, it has n roots. If it's an n-degree polynomial, it has n roots, right? And, and you already live and breathe that truth, because when I said find the three cube roots 
you know, find the three roots of that third degree polynomial in the warm up, you're like, yeah, of course. And of course there should be three roots, you know? In fact, if there were four, you'd be like, no, there aren't, right? Of course there aren't. There are only three. It's n degree, n roots, right? All right, so we're going to do this activity. And actually, I was going to do the activity first, but I, th I thought um, I'd show you one example, at least, just to kind of make sure you're understanding where this is going. So we're going to do one example of how to find the roots using this technique, using Demas, and then I'll have to do this activity. The activity will help you understand maybe how to find the roots, but also to visualize them. Something really cool happens uh, that you really need to see the bullet. It's, it's pretty amazing. OK, so, um, so let's do an example of this. So z cubed equals negative 8. Let's find the solutions to this equation. Let's find the three. We expect, don't we, three solutions to this equation. So we're going to use, we could use that way we did in the warm-up today, but I want to show you another way that's, you could do both, right? I'm not going to, but you could do both and you could compare and see that the results we get just now using this technique are the same as if you were to do the thing we did in the warm-up. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write negative 8 in polar form. It sounds like a crazy move, but let's do it. Now, negative 8 in polar form, what is that? That'd be 8 cis, what's direction? 8 in the pi direction, right? So that'd be 8 cis pi. Again, this seems kind of crazy to write 8 cis pi when negative 8 is such a great way to say it. <laughs> but let's just, let's just go with me, please. Right? It is the same, you acknowledge. And actually, there's no reason we couldn't also say 8 cis 3 pi if we want, right? Or 8 cis 5 pi. Those are all actually the same, all different names for negative 8, aren't they? Again, you're like, OK, me. I'd rather say negative 8. But let's just go with me here. Uh, in fact, so I could actually say this. And for any particular integer n value you would give me, we would have a correct polar form for the number negative 8. Agree? All right, so again, you have to kind of go with me here. And now we're going to take the cube root of both sides, or we might say to the 1 3rd power. So that's what I'm going to do here. Right? So far, so good. Taking both sides to the 1 3rd power. Uh, and then now, here's where Demovs comes in, right? h to the one third is two, but how do we do cis stuff stuff to the one third? How do we take in polar form a number to a power? You multiply the power by the argument of the complex number, and we said yesterday for Demov or today, remember we taught Demov uh, that you could that works for integer n values, but we should stop and say right now Demov actually also works for rational powers uh, like one third, right? So, so exactly we multiply. And so we get one third times the argument in there, which would be that, right? Are you okay with n coming along to the right? Right. And actually, we're done. Well, I mean, we should interpret our, what we've done, right? But but this is it. I mean, these are the these are the cube roots of negative eight. So let's see what we have here. If n is zero, if we let n be zero, remember n can be any integer you like. So let's let n be zero, say. Then we get two cis pi over 3, don't we? If n is 0. If n is 1, we get 2 cis be 3 pi over 3, so yeah, 2 cis pi. And if n is 2, we get 2 cis Five pi over three, and if n is three, we get two cis seven pi over three, right? Which is just coterminal. Seven pi over three is just coterminal with pi over three. So feel free to go further here and do n equals four and n equals five, but you're just going to get a re repeat on these values, okay? But these three are actually unique. Let's actually say what they are in rectangular form. This first one is two times. Remember, cosine and sine of pi over 3 we need here. If we put them back in rectangular form. So pi over 3 is a cosine of a half and a sine of root 3 over 2, right, times i. So this first one in rectangular form is 1 plus root 3 times i. This one here is 2 times negative 1 plus 0 i, right? That's the cosine and the sine of pi, although you could just think about it, right? What is it? Ah, of course we expected that answer before we ever did anything at all in this problem. We expected, we hoped, 
that negative two should be one of our answers. So that's maybe just a good confirmation that we might not be doing things wrong. Right? We should get negative two as one of our three answers because we know it's one. And then what's this other one down here? Similar to this here, right? We get the cosine and sine of five pi over three are one half, positive a half, and negative root three over two respectively, right? Or the cosine and sine of five pi over three down here, right? And so that'll be one minus root three over, root three i. Okay. So there they are. Those are the three cube roots of negative eight. One of them is the one you expected, but maybe these are the ones that are kind of cool that came out as well. Um, awesome. What else can we say about that? Well, I think there's some other interesting things we could say about that. Um, yeah, you could do the quadratic formula thing. You know, you could do the way we did in the warm up, and you should get these three answers also. I should say that. Uh, the other thing to notice is that if you have a polynomial, if you ever have a polynomial equation that has real coefficients, right? There's no i's in this equation, right? Then if there are complex solutions, then they come in, you remember this from first semester, they come in conjugate pairs. Do you see them here? So those are conjugate pairs. This is a conjugate pair right here. Do you agree? Okay. Now, all bets are off if the problem we start with is like z cubed equals negative 8 i. All bets are off. Do they come in conjugate pairs? No. Not necessarily. The only reason we ever had that happen is because we had polynomials the first semester that always had real coefficients and everything. Everything in the polynomial was real. Okay, that's the reason that happens. So, but in this case, we do expect conjugate pairs, and we got one. Okay. So we should notice that too. So then, the cool thing about this activity, I'm going to hand the activity out now too, is um, is to kind of visualize what's happening in a complex plane. What happens if you plot these three solutions? What do you see? And what do you notice? And what would happen with fifth roots, or sixth roots, or seventh roots, or eighth roots? Uh, um, I think that's going to be the surprise. You're going to be delighted and surprised. You're going to need your calculator for this activity. Um, and make sure you follow the directions really closely. Okay. Feel free to work with someone nearby. Make sure you follow the activity pretty closely. It, needs, it says, like, put it in degree mode. So put it in degree mode. It says put it in parametric mode. So do whatever it says to do, do it. Okay. Um, Bust out your calculator. Um, so how, how's it going? I, I mean, I'm hoping that you're you're close to completion on the front side. If you guys would pay attention for just a second, I want to show you what you should be seeing on your calculator. Thanks, Dan. Um, Take a look up here on the calculator. Did you guys get did you guys get this picture on your calculator, something like this? Yes. Right? It should be the one that's reflected on the bottom of the page there, right? David. Um, when you trace this, uh, if you're in rectangular grid coordinates, where is it? Second format. If you if you trace this, you guys, you have a table down there that has four columns, right? So the first two columns say x and y, and those I want you to just pull right off your calculator. If you're tracing, it should say x and y, 1.618, which by the way, you should recognize the number 1.618, um, comma 1.176 or whatever, right? So write those down in your column for x and y for the first point, and as you trace, if you hit the right arrow, it goes left actually, right? It goes, okay. But then write down those points, of course, there's the point negative two, comma zero. What you're looking at is, even though it's the parametric coordinate system, it's really, we're pretending like this is the complex plane, right? So are you guys seeing what we're saying? So fill in those columns x and y. And to fill in the third column, which says x plus yi, you just need to write for that like first one, 1 1.618 plus 1.176i. You with me on that? Okay, so there's no, no big trick on that because we're pretending like that x is the real part and y is the imaginary part. All right, then, hey guys, one more thing. The last column, the last column, hear me, hear me. The last column says put it in polar form. You don't need to do the conversion, just cheat. Go here and use format polar grid coordinates. And then when you go tra to trace now, look what it says. Ah, two cis 36 degrees, two cis 108 degrees, etc. right? You with me on that? So you can just, should be pretty quick to fill in those columns. I should say, um, I should say one more thing, hey guys. Uh, what are you looking at right now? Pentagon. You're looking at a pentagon, okay, but the, the, the five vertices are the five 
fifth roots, aren't those, I mean, hopefully you're catching this. These are the five fifth roots of negative 32. Now there's nothing, there's, uh, there's actually not a pentagon here. It's a fiction. Um, it's an artifice of your calculator's uh, you know, algorithms inside. What your calculator does when it plots anything, including this, is it takes the points it's plotting and then connects them by a line. It always does this, right? So the line has actually nothing to do with the picture, but it is cool, right? They are evenly spaced around the complex plane, around a circle of radius two, separated by 72 degrees, right? Which is still remarkable and beautiful. Um, did you guys answer the, the, the question on the top of that next page too? How would you complete the circle? How could you adjust the things we typed into the calculator to get, what was your answer? Just like, um, add the t -step. Yeah, just make t-step go up to, like, if you want to complete it, you could make it instead of, I think it's four right now. Yeah. Make it five instead. This should follow on nicely after the example I did with the cube roots, right? We said if we start repeating, right? And if you wanted to make, have it keep going around the pentagon, you could keep upping that, right? Uh, t-step right now is representing, uh, like if t right here, so t is zero, uh, zero here, and then if we hit right, t step operates is dictating what the next thing we get is, right? So if I hit right, it's going to go off by whatever the t step we said was. And t step right now is one. So when I hit right, it goes up by one. If you made t step 0.5, it would actually go, it would go to 0.5. What? what yeah. So this is actually intentionally skippy. It's actually skipping around way more than we normally, we really want, normally we want that t-step to be really, really small to get a really nice smooth picture. But here we want only those integer values of t. Oh, so We're really kind of, so t is n for us, right? So we want t to be an integer value, so we're gonna make the t-step be the number one. Yeah, so we're kind of cheating to make this happen for us, right? We're pretending t is n, we're pretending x and y are the real imaginary parts so we can see the complex plane. Yeah. You might, I know you're not, if you've done the first whole page and you've gone, gone on the first the two problems on the back, then that's awesome, that's where I want you to be. If you started doing the other problems down on the bottom of the second page on the back, um, great, but you, that doesn't, you don't need to, that's the, and I don't need you to do them tonight or anything either. Um, so I, but I wanted to do one more example with you and also kind of summarize where we're at because we have about five more minutes and I just, you know, just want to wrap things up. So hopefully you've discovered something very interesting. I said, so the five fifth groups we just discovered are did, did you see it? Like I said, the Pentagon is not really the important part, even though it's pretty. The point, the big takeaway is the five fifth roots of a number, in this case, negative 32, are spaced evenly around a circle centered at the origin of a complex plane. Right? In this case, a, a circle of radius 2. And all the roots are perfectly symmetric, they're spaced 72 degrees apart in the complex plane. That should be, in itself, beautiful to you, right? Uh, or if you're looking for the cube roots, like the one example we did here, right? What do these look like if you plot them? Those are the vertices, uh, if you were like thinking about, them. those are three spaced evenly around the complex plane. So they're separated by 120 degrees, right? 120 degrees around the complex plane, or if you wanted to connect them, it would be a triangle, a equilateral triangle if you wanted, right? But there's a beautiful symmetry to what's happening, and I hope you see that with some of the higher roots too. I thought we'd do one more example, and then I, I want to say one more big thing, too, uh, as well. Okay, so let's do one more example together without, I, I don't want you to use the calculator as a crutch. I want to make sure you understand how to do it, like, from first principles, too. But it is fun to visualize it on the calculator, I think, right? All right, so let's do this one together right now. I don't think this one is in your thing, but I thought we'd do it. Um, so here we go. This is uh, an example of something we might like to be able to do, too, right? This is the fifth roots of this crazy complex number, okay? So the first thing I would do is put it in polar form. I think we all agree. Uh, but that's not maybe not trivial. Let's think about how we put this in polar form. The way I think about it, you could do r equals the square root of 16 root 2 squared plus 16 root 2 squared. You figure all that out. And you, could, you would get the same answer as I'm going to get. But I'm going to start hacking the system because I kind of know what this looks like. So I might do 32 times negative root 2 over 2 plus root 2 over 2 times i. I still haven't messed with the one-fifth power yet, but you, do, you, do you see what I'm doing? Because that makes it obvious to me that r is 32. And the angle is what? What angle has a cosine and a sine? What is it? 3 pi over 4. 3 pi over 4. Okay. 
So do you see how I could get this in polar form pretty quickly just by using kind of what I know about the unit circle and cup, right? You're also welcome to go through the machinery that we, we've, we've built up, and you're welcome to do that, and you will get the same answer. But, but we can start being a little bit faster and lucid with this, okay? It's 32 units long, and maybe you just know that this is at 3 pi over 4. Uh, or, wait, not 3 pi over 4, or anything coterminal to that angle, right? Okay. So we should say that too, even though it seems crazy right now. And actually, before we jump in and apply, apply to mobs, let's, before we even apply to mobs, make this just a little nicer for us here. That's 3 pi plus 8 pi n over 4. Okay, I think that'll make our lives just a little easier. Okay, now I think we're ready to apply to mobs. Here we go. So 32 to the 1 fifth is 2, sis. And then what do we get here? 3 pi plus 8 pi n over what? What'd you say? Over 20. Good. So now if n is 0, we get 2 cis 3 pi over 20. If n is 1, we get 2 cis 11 pi over 20. If n is 2, we get 2 cis, we're stepping up by 8 pi every time up here, right? So 19 pi over 20. If n equals 3, we get 2 cis, what's 8 plus 19? 27 pi over 20. If n equals 4, we get 2 cis 35 pi over 20. And if n equals 5, we get uh, 43 pi over 20 in there, which is actually coterminal to 3 pi over 20, isn't it? So we're all, and we expected that. If that that's a good check though to make sure we're not crazy. They do start repeating, right? Because we expect only five answers and we just got them. If you start repeating to n equals five, six, seven, you'll start getting the same answers. Okay. And thank goodness that it says keep it in polar form because I don't really want to deal with these in rectangular form, right? But none of these are real nice angles at all. So we'll just leave them that way because it said to. If we really wanted it with a calculator, we could get it in rectangular form too, or approximate the cosine and sine of all these things, and we have it. But so this is cool, and um, that's the way you're gonna do some of the homework tonight. By the way, when it says the cube roots of unity or whatever, or the fifth roots of unity, it means the fifth roots of one. Unity means one. Okay. So that's. I think it'll ask that in the homework. You should know what that means. Unity means one, the number one. If they if they say find the six 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 roots of the, of unity, they mean the six roots of what's number one. Right. Yeah.